Amen. Well, it is just a blessing, as always, to get to worship uh, with you today. And today's a special day for us to be able to gather together on Mother's Day. And so I just want to say again uh, a huge thank you to all the moms that are in the room for everything you do, for everything you've done, uh, for the ways that you sacrifice yourselves for us. Uh, None of us, quite literally, would be in this room if it wasn't for our moms. Uh, But we wouldn't be who we are today if it wasn't for our mothers. And so we just say again, thank you, uh, especially uh, if you've been a mom and our mom who pursues Jesus. And we just thank you for the grace of God in your life. Every family that has a mother, grandmother, who loves Jesus, loves the Word, is a gift of grace to that family. And we know that there's a lot of effort and a lot of tears and just loss, all the things that come in being a parent. So we just thank you for what you do. And and we do recognize, as Pastor Austin said, that for some, Mother's Day can be really challenging due to loss, due to dreams and hopes that you've had that haven't been realized. And so if that's you here this morning, we just want to say we love you, we're praying for you today, and that today that your joy would be able to be in the Lord uh, as well. So this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. So if you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to turn there. If you don't, there's one in the seat back in front of you. We'd love to give you as a gift if you don't have a copy of God's Word. And this morning, we got to be a part of something really special with the parent commissioning and all the families on stage. You you got to see my son throw his hat down in front of everybody, which is awesome. You know, so we're working on him um, and honoring his mother and all that stuff. And so uh, it's a joy And if you are here this morning and you're a parent who is on the stage, I just want to speak to you for a second and say thank you. Uh, Parent commissioning is not about parading our kids in front of the church. It's not about showing pictures so we can ooh and awe. It's it's about saying, this is what these parents are saying, we want to lay down our lives so that our kids can see Jesus. And they're looking to you and to me as the church saying, we need your help. We need you. And so I just want to urge you, if you are a member here of the faith family at Tri-Cities, these families, they need you. They need you to be in their life group and fight alongside of them. They, they need you to be the small group leader for their child in kids' group or as a teenager in student ministry. They need your prayers. If you see them out in the hallway, you may not know them, but ask them how they're doing. Ask them specifically how you can pray for them. They need you. And one of the beautiful graces of the church is we get to do this thing together. And so, parents, thank you for doing that. I want to encourage you to be committed to this body so that they can be committed to you. And it's just a beautiful thing. And so this morning, uh, we're, we're in Acts. We're continuing on the series. I'm actually going to jump a little bit ahead of where we are. We're going to be at the end of Acts chapter 4. Um, And we're going to be looking at the life of a hero of the faith in the early New Testament church. And uh, I want to look at his life and who he was and why he was the way he was as a model for those of us who want to follow God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength, and specifically to parents, grandparents, and caregivers this morning. So if, if you have a child in your life or you're invested in the next generation, um, there's going to be some specific things out of this message that I want to be able to speak to you. Now, if, if you're here and you're not a parent, one day you might be, or you're not right now, uh, there's a lot here that's going to be applicable for you as well. Uh, but we're going to be talking about what, what does it look like to be a hero in the faith? So we're going to look at one. And then what were some things that were true in his life, that they become true in your life and my life, will not only revolutionize our lives, but could impact our kids for the glory of God. And so uh, when I think about heroes of the faith, I think about people in this book. I think about people like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. I think about people throughout church history like Athanasius and Polycarp and St. Augustine and Martin Luther. Uh, I think about people like Billy Graham, Charles Spurgeon, Dwight Moody. When I think about uh, heroes of the faith, I also think about people who have been in my life major influences. And one of those who's a hero of the faith for me is my mom. And on Mother's Day, I thought, man, it'd be really fitting just to be able to say that this is a truth for me. A lot of who I am today is because of my mom. And if you know my mom, she loves Jesus. 
I think about words that describe her. She's consistently faithful. She's the same. She doesn't ride the roller coaster that a lot of us do. She's strong and steady and steadfast, whether it was a normal day in the house or whether it was one of those days when one of the six of us got left at church and someone's calling, you know, and, you know, you have a child here, you need to come get it. It wasn't the panic, it was go, or we get hurt, all those kind of things. But she's just consistent, she's faithful, she's generous. I saw her and my dad lay down so much of what they could have done for themselves for the good of our kids, but not just for us as kids, but for our church family. They were just generous to people in need, generous to you, people who my mom was and is and just intentionally invested. She was invested in our lives as kids. She always had time for us, still has time for us, but she was intentionally invested in the church family. We grew up loving the church because my parents loved the church. It wasn't just something we went to or had to go to. They loved this family. They love it. We grew up loving it. She's sacrificially loving toward us as kids, toward others. I've, I've seen that in her. And I want to be like her, and I am so much of who I am today because of her, and I'm not perfect. You can ask my wife. She can spend a lot longer time in the sermon telling you why I'm not perfect and my faults. But whatever I am, who I am today, is ultimately because of the grace of Jesus Christ in my life, but it's also because of the grace of Jesus Christ through people in my life like my mom. And I want to be like that. I want to be a parent like that. I, I want to be that to my children. I want to be a part of a church that our family is brought up with people who love Jesus like that. And so the question that I want you to wrestle with, and I want us to wrestle with this morning, is how do we become people like that? And I think we see that in the life of this man named Barnabas this morning. So if you look at me, uh, with me in Acts 4, we're going to start in verse 32. We want to read this passage. I'm just going to ask two questions about Barnabas' life that we're going to try to answer this morning that I really do think will be impactful for you and for I if we can grab a hold of what's here. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, which is just an amazing statement. Nothing that they owned was theirs. That's what the gospel does. It changes the way we see everything, including our stuff. Verse 33, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Verse 36, Barnabas enters the scene. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. I want to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Father, we need you this morning. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd move, that you'd change us. We thank you that your word does not return void. Open our eyes to see you. Convict our hearts to repentance so that we might follow you. It's your name we pray. Amen. So here's two questions that I want to ask and try to answer together this morning. The first one is this. Why is Barnabas a hero of the faith in the New Testament? This early church, and we're walking through the book of Acts, so you're going to see this come out more, but why is he such an influential person in the early church? What does he do? What happens in his life that causes him to be this kind of influence? And the answer to that question is really kind of the, the behind the scenes or the kind of the title of this whole series that we're walking through. And it's that Barnabas is a hero of the faith because he lived a life unleashed with the gospel. What made Barnabas such a powerful player in the early church was his life was unleashed by the gospel. Everything he was, he laid down because of Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has died in your place, in my place. God of the universe becoming man, taking your sin and my sin, dying and raising again from death to life, defeating death in the grave. That was not just something he understood mentally. It captured his heart, and it was unleashed in his life. 
And so I want us to look at some ways that this played itself out. And I want you to hang with me because it might feel like where's this going and it's, it's all going to come together. But I want us to look at Barnabas' life and some of the encounters that are there. We're going to look at um, just five different ways the gospel played itself out in his life. And then we're going to try to answer the question, okay, what caused him to be the way he was? And what does that mean for us? So the first thing we see in Barnabas' life that the gospel did in him is that it gave him a new identity. We just read it, but I love that in verse 36 it says, Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, means son of encouragement. What, what was happening here? Barnabas was such a different person that the early church gave him a new name. When God rescues you through the gospel, if you're here and you're Jesus followers, you get a new name. You get a new identity. You know, I've wondered this, and I'd kind of be afraid to ask like, the people around me, if you were to give me a new name based on the way I acted, what would you call me? And I, I don't know what it would be, but wouldn't it be so cool if the people around you said, man, you're an encouragement. What would you be named? What would you be known for? And the gospel had so changed him, he got a new name. I love Psalm 40. It says in Psalm 40 that you've put a new song in my mouth. Many will see and hear and give praise to our God. When, when the gospel captures you, it gives you a new name. That happened to him. Barnabas was a man who embodied encouragement in his life. There was life change that was there. But not only did the gospel give him a new name in the early church that everyone knew about, it gave him a new treasure. Look at verse 37. He sold a field that belonged to him. He brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Why would anyone sell their land and turn all the proceeds back over to the church? Did he have to? No. Why would he do that? Because in Christ he had a better treasure. I love in Hebrews 10, it talks about people of faith. It says they joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods because in Christ they had a better possession. When the gospel captures your heart, you get a new treasure. And that treasure changes the way you view the resources that God has given you. He was willing to give away his resources to become sacrificially devoted because in Christ he had a better possession. What would this kind of contentment in Christ look like in your life? In my life? And so as we chase these things in Barnabas, one of, the, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is look at your own life and say, are these things true of me? Do I have a new name? Do people see a different identity in me? Do I have a new treasure? Am I willing to lay down all the things that God has entrusted to me to give back to him? So we see Barnabas was not only a powerful influence at the beginning of the early church, but his influence began to grow. So if you have a Bible, begin to turn over to Acts chapter 9. And in Acts 9... Verse 26 through 28, we see the next uh, place where Barnabas comes into the story and his impact grows. I just want to read this to us. And when he came to Jerusalem, he being Saul, the Apostle Paul, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. So we haven't gotten to the story of the Apostle Paul yet. That's coming in the narrative but he was a persecutor of the church. He threw Christians in jail. He consented to the stoning and death of Stephen. And so the apostles, when they heard that Paul was supposedly now a believer, they didn't believe him. They thought, this is a trap. This is a trick. There's no way. We can't let him in. But guess who goes to Saul? Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him in to the apostles. He declared to them on the road he had seen the Lord, he spoke to him, and how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jesus, at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. So not only is Barnabas a major impactor in the early church, now Barnabas is bringing in the apostle Paul. When no one else would believe in him, when no one else trusted with him, the gospel had given Barnabas a new heart, a heart of faith, instead of a heart of fear. And so when everyone saw Saul, they were afraid. But when Barnabas saw Saul, he saw the faith of God. He wasn't afraid of what Saul might do to him. He walked in faith, not by sight. 
And so now we see Barnabas bringing Saul in. And think about how important the Apostle Paul is. Think about how much of the New Testament is written by Paul. How important Barnabas is in this story. We don't get Romans. We don't get Ephesians. We don't get Colossians. We don't get all those things unless Barnabas brings Paul in. Let's keep going. Next time we see Barnabas is in Acts 11. In Acts 11, 20 through 26. And here we see that the gospel for the first time is beginning to break outside of the Jewish tradition to the Gentiles. It says, But there are some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, which is Greek-speaking Jews, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And report came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem. And guess who they send? Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them to remain faithful in the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. He was good. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. So the name that we attribute to ourselves, that Christian name, it comes in through Barnabas. You see, the gospel not only gave Barnabas a new identity, it not only gave him new treasure, it not only gave him a new heart of faith, but it also gave him a new purpose and passion. And that purpose and passion led him to get outside of the comfort zone of being in Jerusalem with the rest of the Jews, to go to the Greeks, to go to the Gentiles, and take the gospel where it had not been named. You remember, if you've been a part of the series, that the promise by Jesus that the gospel would be first their witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. This is now happening. And Barnabas is at the forefront of taking to the gospel to those who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And Christians, and that word comes about Christ followers. And he's right in the center of it. And then I'll look at one more in Acts 15. And there's so many more that we could chase where Barnabas is again, he's a major influencer in what we know of the Bible in the early church. In verses 36 through 39, it says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return to visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And so in their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, their best buds, they're going together, they're doing this. They take John Mark with them, and he abandons them. He leaves them behind, he can't take it, he jumps out. And so now they're about to go off again on another missionary journey, and Barnabas says, hey, let's give John Mark another chance. Paul says, no way. There's no way I'm taking him with us again. And so a sharp disagreement arose, and they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas and goes. And I'm not going to try to chase who's right, who's wrong. But one of the things I think is incredible about Barnabas' life that we see here is that the gospel gave him new eyes. He saw not what John Mark had done or who he was. He saw who he could be in Jesus Christ. The gospel does that. It causes us to see people differently. It causes us to see those people who've caused us a lot of suffering and pain and hurt in our past differently when Jesus is in their life. We don't see them for who they were. We don't see them even for who they are. We see them for who they can be in Christ. And when we look at the rest of the narrative of Scripture, here's what we see. John Mark, who Barnabas takes in, will later become Peter's assistant. See that in the end of 1 Peter, it says it's written by the hand of Mark. And church history goes on to tell us that John Mark would eventually author the gospel of Mark that's in this book that we read. Church history also tells us in 2 Timothy 4 that Paul later on will send for Mark. And he says, send John Mark to me because he's very useful for me. That even Paul's perspective of John Mark changes. Think about the people who've counted you out. Think about the people you've counted out. Barnabas didn't see John Mark for who he was. He saw him for who he could be in Christ. And so this man we see influencing at the early church, at the beginning of the spread of the church. 
We see him bringing the Apostle Paul in, who will become one of the most prolific Christians of all history. We see him taking the gospel to people outside of the Jewish audience, which is really good news for us, because most of us are Gentiles, right? And we see him investing in Mark, who will become a major influence in this Bible that we hold in our hands, and the gospel will go out through him. Why was Barnabas this way? Because he lived a life unleashed with the gospel. But why did he live a life unleashed with the gospel? Here's where I want us to get. What caused Barnabas to live a life unleashed with the gospel? What caused Barnabas to have a new identity? What caused Barnabas to have new eyes, to have a new treasure, to have a new heart? What, what caused that in him? And if that happens in you, and if that happens in me, it could have the potential to change everything. And for those of us who are parents or grandparents in this room, if this happens in us, it could have the potential to impact our kids in a way that really, really matters. So what caused Barnabas to become a hero of the faith? I think there's two very clear factors that we see in Acts 4. So we're going to go back to Acts 4, and we're going to bring this together. What caused Barnabas to become a hero of the faith? The first is this. We've already covered it. The extravagant grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus captured his heart. The gospel captured Barnabas' heart. Look at verse 33, if you're with me in Acts 4. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The writer doesn't tell us Barnabas' salvation story. We don't know when it occurred. It, it could have been while Jesus' earthly ministry was going on. It could have been post-resurrection. It could have been, he could have been the crowd at Pentecost when Peter preached the message that we've been walking through. It could have been last week when Pastor Daniel was walking through John 3 and Peter and John healed the lame man and they preached and thousands were added. It could have been anywhere in here, but it's very specific that they were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus and grace, grace was on them all. Who's a part of the all? Barnabas, that at some point the good news of the gospel had captured his heart and turned his life upside down. Friends, has that happened to you? Not just do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, or believe that God is, or believe the Bible is true. Has the gospel captured your heart? Is Jesus your joy? Is your hope in him? Do you have a new identity? Do you have a new treasure? Do you have a new heart? Do you have a new faith? Do you have new eyes the way you see the world? Is that happening in you? When you see these things in Barnabas' life, are those things happening in you? And maybe you're here this morning that hasn't happened to you or in you. Your response is to place your faith in Christ alone this morning. To save you, to rescue you. That happened in Barnabas' life. But there's also a second factor here, and I think it's one that's so easy to overlook that I did it for years. There's something else at play in Barnabas' life that made him who he was. That I think if we can get a hold of, especially those of us who are are parents, who are grandparents, caregivers, it has massive potential for kingdom impact. And here's the second thing. What caused Barnabas to become a hero of the faith Family discipleship was his foundation. Family discipleship was Barnabas' foundation. You might say, where in the world did you get that from? All right, so let's look at it together. Acts 4, 36. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite. If you circle, if you underline, if you highlight in your Bible, those are two very important words. A Levite. It's not very often in the book of Acts where the author gives us the lineage of the people he introduces. So this is significant. It's important. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have told us this. Barnabas was a Levite. Who were the Levites? They were the Jews who were entrusted with the law of God. They knew the law. They grew up with the Torah. 
They grew up memorizing it. They knew it. They meditated on it. What does that mean? It means that somewhere in Barnabas' life, the Bible doesn't tell us where, the Bible doesn't tell us who, but someone in his life, a parent, a grandparent, an influencer, taught him the truth of God's word. Taught him the foundations of Elohim. Taught him about who God was and the foundation. And so when the gospel of Jesus Christ captured Barnabas' heart, he had the foundation that was centered on God and his word already there. And when those two things come together, the potential is powerful for kingdom impact. Well, you might ask, well, Paul, how do we really know that he actually knew the law? Good question. Let's keep going. A Levite, a native of Cyprus, verse 37, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Why would he do this? This is not random. This is not just an act of generosity. Do you you know why he did this? Because he knew the law. And in Deuteronomy 15, you can write this down and go back and look at it later. I'll, I'll read it to us now. Deuteronomy 15, verse 4, says this. But there will be no poor among you. For the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess. So what's the point? Why did Barnabas sell his field and give it to the rest of the church? Because he knew the Old Testament. And his love for Jesus inspired and compelled him to faithfully follow what was written in this book. Barnabas had a gospel foundation. He had a foundation centered on God that was given to him when he was young. This is so important for us. If you're here this morning and you are a parent, you are a grandparent, you are a caregiver, the greatest thing that you can give to your child is to teach them the truth of God's Word. Consistently, to make it the priority of your home, to make it the priority of their life, to help them understand the fullness of Scripture. And when that, coupled with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, grabs a hold of their life, those two things change everything. Now, can you have no foundation in God's Word, and God save you and rescue you, and you still make an impact for the glory of God? Absolutely. 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 But think about what happens when those two things come together. And we see this time and time and time again in the early church. Think about the Apostle Paul. What was he before he became a Christ follower? He was a Pharisee. He grew up studying the law. He knew the law in and out. The reason why we have Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians, all throughout those books, Paul is defending the Old Testament. He's showing how the Old Testament points to Christ. That foundation that was laid in his life by his parents, by the synagogue, was built up in him to help him understand who Jesus was. And that foundation, coupled with the gospel, turned the world upside down. I was talking about my mom earlier. Why am I the way I am today? By the grace of Jesus Christ, I am what I am. But also through a mom and a dad who loved this book and taught me this book. When the power of the gospel comes alongside a life that's been grounded and centered upon God, it changes everything. So if, if you want to be a kind of parent, a kind of person who leaves a legacy, put it around what matters most. Make it about God's Word. Make it about the Gospel. This is why we've put together a family discipleship plan to help you. Something that can go from birth all the way to graduation that gives you tools and resources that helps you be able to do this so that your child, your son, your daughter can grow up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And so it seems like such a big thing. What does it mean to be a hero of the faith really? How could I ever be a hero of the faith? And when you really boil it down to Barnabas' life, you see two things at work. The gospel of Jesus Christ which is accessible to every single person that's alone. New identity, a new heart, new eyes, new passion. 
And you see family discipleship. You see a foundation that was laid on Christ. We sang about earlier cornerstone, Christ alone cornerstone. Barnabas had a foundation that was laid on God, that God is one. We have the ability to do that. And so, in closing, how do you do that practically? Where do you begin? Where, where do you start? How do we begin laying a God-centered foundation for our children? And even if you're here and you're not a parent, and you're a teenager or whatever, it doesn't matter where you are, these principles are still, they apply to you personally. But I just want to give us a place to start and then we'll be finished this morning. Very quickly. How do you begin laying a gospel-centered foundation? These come out of Deuteronomy 6, which Barnabas would have known. The first one is this. I would challenge you, love God most. If you want your kids, if you want the next generation to love God, we must first love God most. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Love Him most. Let Him be your greatest treasure. Let Him be your passion. The reason, one of the reasons why I am who I am is because my mom and my dad, they love God most. It's compelling. Be a parent who loves God more than your success at work. Be a parent who loves God more than your child's success on the ball field. Be a parent who cares more about God and loving Him than loving the stuff or the vacation plan or all those kind of things. Love God most. Make Him the priority of your life. Here's the second this practical thing I would encourage you to do. Lead by example. Lead by example. If, if you want your children to love the church, you've got to love the church. You can't just go to church, you have to actually love the church. If you want your child to be in Christian community and value Christian friendships and relationships, you have to value that. That has to be a part of who you are. Grandparents, that has to be a part of who you are if you want your grandkids to see that in you. If you want your child to love God's Word, you've got to love God's Word. Read. Let them see you reading the Word. If you want your children to be children who are prayer warriors. Let them see you pray on your knees in the morning. This is one of the reasons why we ask all of our parents to bring elementary age on up into worship gatherings, because your children need to see you worship your Savior. They need to see you take communion. They need to see baptism. They need to see mom and dad opening God's Word and listening to the pastor opening up. It, they need to see that in you. Model it. Lead by example. I got to see that in my parents, my mom. Third, I would encourage you to leverage a strategy. Leverage a strategy. In Deuteronomy 6, it says to teach them diligently these things. You need a strategy. You need intentionality. Discipleship and spiritual growth, it doesn't happen haphazardly. It's not random. It's not accidental. It's intentional. And that's why we've developed the family discipleship plan to help you. One big truth a week, one verse a week, all kinds of hooks and illustrations that you can use to help you bring it out in the home. If, you're like, if you don't understand the Bible, that's okay. There's all kinds of guides and explanations of passages. It's so easy and it gives you one thing that you can take with you and you can download it on the app. You can print it off. So whether you're here this Sunday or on vacation next, it goes with you. And we teach it on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And so that truth that you're saying in the home also gets said here by the small group leaders and teachers. And it gives you something that can build and develop and it's written developmentally for where your children are. It's a great first step. Leverage a strategy. The only way we become disciplined is with strategy in our lives. We all need strategy and intentionality, especially in this area. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, we were at the dinner table. We actually had life groups, and so we were scurrying around like all people do because your house isn't really clean. You try to make it look clean before everybody comes. At least um, that's a lot of times the case for us with four kids. And so we were doing that. And, and one of my children, Camden, was struggling finishing his food, which is an often occurrence for him. You know? And so the penalty or punishment for not finishing your food is you don't get dessert. That's kind of the way it is. And so we were in the final hour. He ran out of time. He's like, Camden, you're done. I'm sorry. There's no food. And Jack was in the room. And Jack said, hey, Daddy, can I take Camden's place? Can, can I take his place and take his punishment for him? I said, why would you do that? Well, I want him to get to have dessert. 
And it's like, no, you can't do that. You know, he needs to be punished. That's what we're doing here. You know, so, <laughs> good gospel lesson. No. So, where did that come from? I mean, that was awesome that Jack would do that. Where, where did that come from? Well, guess what we've been talking about the week before in the family discipleship plan? That Mr. Harold Ms. Mar- and Miss uh, Marlowe, they've been talking about substitution. We've been talking about it in the home for several weeks. We were coming up on Easter, and he was hearing it here. Mrs. Laura and Mr. Harold, they were talking about substitution and what it means to take someone's place. That didn't happen randomly. It didn't happen accidentally. He was learning about the gospel, and that was now coming out in life. And it was that weekly doing it again and again, and sometimes it doesn't seem like anything's getting through. And then this moment happens, and we have a gospel opportunity, a gospel conversation. That's what strategy does. It builds opportunity in. Fourthly is this, long to make the moments matter. Life is short. For those of us who are Christians, we understand life is a vapor. Life is a mist. It's here today, gone tomorrow. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're only guaranteed today. So long to make the moments matter. Long to see that his mercies are new every morning. Today is a new opportunity that I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. So I'm not living for tomorrow. I'm faithful today. That today I can show the gospel to my children. I might have missed it yesterday. I might have messed it up. I might have forgotten. But today I've been given this grace. And you can do that today. You can do that today. And lastly is this. Lay down your life for God's glory. Lay down your life for God's glory. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, there's only one God. There's only one hero. Why, hang with me, we're wrapping up. Why, does the passage that we've been looking at, why does it not mention who taught Barnabas? Why are his parents not mentioned? Why are his grandparents? If if Barnabas did have a family discipleship foundation, why is that not mentioned? Here's why I think it's not mentioned. Because they're not the hero of the story. Jesus is. One of the greatest temptations, dads, moms, to make yourself the hero of the story for your children. Make Jesus the hero of their story. Don't try to be the hero. Mom, stay on Mother's Day. Don't be the hero of Mother's Day. Let God and his grace in you be the hero of Mother's Day today. Your children don't need a better version of you. They need Jesus. They need a parent who says it's not about our family name, it's not about my kid's t-ball name, it's not about their grades, or it's not about any of those things, it's not about how good a parent I am and the fame or likes I get on Instagram or Facebook, it's about Jesus. The reason why they're not written into this story is because it's not about them, it's about God's grace in Barnabas' life. And if they were here, it would be really tempting for us in this moment to make them the hero of the story, that Barnabas is what they are because of these people. But the point is, it's not because of these people, it's because of God's work through these people. Why is my mom consistently faithful? Because Jesus is her anchor for the soul. And he doesn't change yesterday, today, tomorrow, or forever. Why is my mom radically generous? Because when she was poor, Christ who is rich became poor for her sake, so that through his poverty, she might become rich. Why is my mom sacrificially loving? Because God demonstrated his love to her then when she was a still a sinner, Christ died for her. Make Jesus the hero of your life, moms and dads, grandparents, caregivers, everybody. Make Jesus the hero of your life. And when Jesus is the hero of your life, your identity begins to change, your treasure begins to change, the way you see your kids, the way you see others begin to change, everything changes. 
The word becomes the foundation of our lives. We build our lives on him and on this book. And that has the power and potential to change everything. I long for my kids to have that. I long to be that as a dad. I long for that for you as my church and my family. Make Jesus the hero of your life. And you will not regret it. There's a guy named Count Zinzendorf, church history, and he said this, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. That's a good life. Because it is a life that magnifies the name that's above every name. The only name that can bring joy to your heart and to your family. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony that we see this morning in Barnabas' life. We thank you for the people who've gone before us, who've modeled the gospel with their lives. Lord, my prayer is that we would be a church, family, a generation that live for your name above our name, that love you most so that we can love others more. I just pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, that today you would help them to choose you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you're thinking about Barnabas and you're thinking about his life and a new identity, a new name, a new purpose, new eyes, new treasures, is that true of you? Has that ever happened? Do you know Jesus that way? And if you don't, you can. He can become your greatest treasure, he can become your hope. Maybe you've been trying to live and parent and serve out of your own energy and effort. Lay that down. Give it to God. Be saved this morning. If you are here and you're a believer, I would encourage you just to look at your life. What are you living for? Moms, dads, what are you living for? What name are you living for? If I was to sit down with your kids and say, what matters most to mommy or daddy? What what would they say? If you're laboring for something, why not labor for them to understand God's word, to know it, to love it? Are you leading the way? Are you modeling by example? Are you intentional? Are you living today in light of today? The grace the God's given you today. And where you're not, I encourage you, even in this moment, just to repent and ask God for help. Ask your life group for help. Accountability. Grandparents. You're not finished yet. God's not done with you yet. As the band leads us in worship this morning. We want to build our foundation on Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity for you to respond whatever way God would call you to. Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters this morning that you would move in them, that you would change them, you give them your love, help them to understand your love for them. In your name we pray.